The doctors said it was much worse than they thought. Cancer had spread through my body, which would require massive amounts of radiation and chemotherapy. Hi, I'm Pastor Frank of Real Life Church, and that was a prognosis before prayer. These same doctors, just three days later, declared me cancer-free and said it was a remarkable turnaround. Jesus had healed me. That was seven years ago, and today I'm still healed, cancer-free, and going strong. I've given my testimony around the world, and the message has not changed. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I invite you to Real Life Church, where you'll experience the power of God, the power of His Word, and the power of His Holy Spirit. In the meantime, enjoy today's message from one of our recent services. As you listen, God will change your life. this word I will grow by this word I will triumph in this word is my future this word is real life in Jesus name amen turn with me to Acts chapter 2 today being Pentecost Sunday of course we're going to start in Acts chapter 2 and on the day of Pentecost when it was fully come they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each of them they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All right, this is the day of Pentecost. This is what took place. Now it says that fire sat upon each of them, and today the message is called the fire of God. The fire of God. Fire, the first three mentions of fire in the Bible, the very first three mentions. The first one is a mention of judgment, fiery judgment. It's when the fire and brimstone fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah. So the very first mention of fire in the Bible has to do with judgment. The second mention of fire in the Bible has to do with sacrifice. It's when Abraham was taking his son Isaac to the Mount, on Mount Moriah and he took the fire. And his son Isaac noticed that and said, well, we have the wood, we have the fire, but where's the sacrifice? So the second mention of fire has to do with sacrifice. The third mention of fire in the Bible is not in Genesis, but in Exodus. The third mention of fire has to do with a bush that burned with fire but was not consumed. We have three, the first three mentions of fire in God's word. The first has to do with judgment. The second has to do with sacrifice. The third has to do with the presence of God and the word of God being spoken. Now, if we take and look at the three times that fire fell from heaven, three times that fire fell. Now, when, when Moses dedicated the tabernacle, the glory of God fell, doesn't specifically say fire, but when Solomon dedicated the temple, fire fell from heaven. Fire fell on the, the altar, fire consumed the sacrifice. The first one was the temple. The second one was Mount Carmel, when Elijah had the altar constructed. And the second fire fell from heaven in response to the word of God, in response to obeying God. The second, the first one was when the fire fell in the temple. Second one was when fire fell on Mount Moriah, I'm, I'm sorry, on Mount Carmel. The third time fire fell from heaven was this day, the day of Pentecost. And fire fell and sat upon each individual. Those three first mentions of fire in the Bible are the same as those three times when fire fell. We can equate each time the fire is mentioned and the fire fell, even though they're in different places of the Bible. The first one, judgment. The temple is a place of judgment. The fire fell in the temple from God, supernaturally. From then on, all the lighting of the temple was lit from that fire. There was the menorah lit from that fire. They could not let the fire go out. They must keep the fire burning because it was not kindled by man, it was kindled by God. It was the responsibility of the priest to keep a full source of wood, a full source of oil, so they would never, ever, ever let that fire, that supernatural fire, that fire from God go out. They then kindled the fire continually from that fire in the place of sacrifice and in the place of prayer. The place of sacrifice, the sacrificial altar, the place of prayer, the incense altar. That incense altar, that fire, was from the fire of God. The sacrificial fire, from the fire of God. The purpose of the temple was to atone for sin. It was a place of judgment, where your judgment was taken away, where your judgment was passed from you onto the, the sacrifice, where your judgment was passed away through prayer. So it was a place of light and illumination. It was a place of judgment but not judgment where people died or were punished, but where their punishment was lifted, where their judgment was taken from them, 
where there was a substitutionary sacrifice, where there was a substitution of the priest praying. Second, when fire fell from heaven on Mount Carmel, as I said, that is a place of sacrifice. And when the word of God tells us that the fire of that sacrifice was to be a fire for God, not from God, but for God. When Abraham took that fire up, he was going to sacrifice personally. It's not just a sacrifice, it's personal sacrifice. He was taking his only begotten son. When, when Elijah stepped out on Mount Carmel, it was a personal sacrifice. He had been hiding from the king. There were 700 prophets of Baal. He was the only prophet of God. He took a personal step of faith and a personal sacrifice to call Israel to task and to, to look at the prophets and say, you choose your bull and you serve your God and the one who answers by fire will be God. He stood out. He could have been sacrificed himself. But we know that God backed up his word, God backed up his faith, God backed up his sacrifice, and the fire fell on that day, on that sacrifice. Now, we look at the third one. The sacrifice is not on an altar. The fire is not falling on a mountaintop. The fire is not falling on a temple. The fire is falling on people. Can people handle the fire? Can people utilize the fire? The fire is not just a fire to consume. Like the bush, the fire fell with the presence of God on that bush. The fire fell and the presence of God spoke out of that bush. When the fire of God falls on people, it's for the presence of God to inhabit people and for the word of God to go forth from people so that others would be touched by that word. Others would be touched by that presence. But it's all how we handle the fire. In the temple, they could not let the fire go out, but yet people of God. Today, the fire is going out. There are many people that have only embers left, no longer a flame that's burning. Some, the fire has been extinguished completely. It is not up to God to keep the fire burning. It is up to us to keep the fire burning. God let the fire fall, but we keep the fuel for the fire. God caused the fire to fall in the right place, but we are the ones responsible to keep the lamps lit, to keep the oil for the lamps and the wood for the sacrifice and the, the incense. It's up to us to keep the fire burning. Can we handle the fire? Do we know how to utilize the fire? I'll tell you a funny joke I heard recently. There was a man who was learning to parachute and he, he took his first jump out of the plane. And when he jumped out of the plane, he's falling and he forgot where the, the cord was to pull the chute. He was frantic. He couldn't remember. He's going through his checklist trying to remember where the cord was. And while he's doing that, he passes somebody going up. And he shouts at the guy going up, do you know how to open the parachute? And the guy going up says, no, do you know how to light a propane barbecue? Do we know how to handle the fire? Do we know how to handle the fire? The fire is not just to blow in, blow up, and blow out. Too many Christians blow in, blow up, and blow out. You've seen them come to church. You've seen them come in and get all excited. You've seen them blow up here, and you've seen them blow out. The last thing you want when you're driving is a blowout. The last thing you, you know when a blow, you can't get anywhere. You can't go forward with a blowout. When the fire falls on us, it is for judgment, but not to judge us. It burns that which is not able to be used by God, just like the chaff is burned out. For example, another digress for a moment. 1348, the Black Death struck Europe. 50 to 70% of the populations of Europe wiped out. Some places where they have good records, like the city of Florence, it looks like between 50 and 70% of the people died from 1348 to 1351. It came back each spring and summer and fall, year after year after year and wiped them out. Nobody knew what was causing it. It was the flea, and the, the bubonic plague was in the flea. Nobody knew that, so they had no idea how to stop it. 1665, it came back in different parts of Europe. It came back to London. It's called the Great Plague of London. It was the same thing, the Black Death, the bubonic plague. 30% of the population of London died, 30%. It would have killed perhaps 50 to 70 to 80 percent of the population if unchecked. They still, 300 years later, still didn't understand it, still didn't know what was causing it. September 2nd, 1666, the Great Fire of London broke out. London was built primarily of wood, wooden structures, even if they were the Tudor-type houses, they were wooden frame. 
almost all of London burned to the ground. It was called the Great Fire of London, but guess what? The plague stopped because the fire consumed the rats and the fleas. That's the purpose of fire in the believer, to consume the rats and the fleas of our life. The rats and the fleas that would try to be around us. The rats and the fleas that would try to infect us with the world, with the ways of the world or the ways of the culture, with the people around us that are not believers like us. We don't need to remove them, we need to change them to bring them into the things of God. When the fire fell on the day of Pentecost, it says there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat on each one of them. Is the fire upon you today? Is the fire sitting on you today? Is the fire burning in you today? Is the fire going out or is the fire getting greater? Is it turning into a bonfire, a forest fire, or is it turning into a birthday candle? Which way is the fire going in your life? The fire can either spread or it can be put out. There are many, many firefighters in the world that firefight for good. They're putting out forest fires. They're putting out fires in cities and towns and villages. But there are many, many spiritual firefighters that think they're doing good, but are trying to extinguish the flame of God, trying to extinguish the faith of God, extinguish what you have. Many people that will tell you, as we heard already, it's not for today. It's no longer for today. It was for the early church. It was for for someone to get the church started, but not for us to keep it going. Well, once you start the fire, you keep it going, is what I see. Once the fire fell in the temple, they were to keep it going. So once the fire fell on the day of Pentecost, it's our responsibility still to keep it going. To keep it going. To keep fueling. Without fuel, there's no fire. We must provide the fuel. We must provide the fuel for the fire. So in the upper room, we had the presence of God. And when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit today, we have the presence of God. Each and every one of us, filled with the Holy Spirit, has the presence of God in a flame of fire, doesn't consume us, consumes the chaff, consumes the things that are not of God, but we remain and his presence is upon us and his voice speaks through us. That's the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's why immediately they began to speak out. Immediately, they began to vocalize what was happening, the supernatural event that was happening. They vocalized. And I I took down a a, a note that I don't even see. The Lord spoke to me something about this, about, oh, the first evidence. The first evidence was speaking in tongues. The first evidence. People are so afraid of this. It's the first evidence, but it's an abiding privilege. It's the first evidence, but it's an abiding privilege. Speaking in tongues. It is not something to be ashamed of. It's not something to push to the side. It's not something to, well, you know, we'll let you in the church, but you just hush up. Don't be real loud. No, it is an abiding privilege. It was the first evidence. It's an abiding privilege. Secondly, it was the vocal release of the two-edged sword. It's the vocal release of the two-edged sword. His prayer on our lips. His prayer, one edge, our lips, the second edge. It's a two-edged sword. This is, in reality, the sword of the Spirit. Praying in the Holy Ghost, you're praying the will of God, you're praying the Word of God, but He is inspiring it. He is motivating it. It's according to His will. The Word of God tells us when we pray in the Holy Ghost, we pray according to the perfect will of God. So we are praying with a two-edged sword. We are operating with a two-edged sword. We are defeating the enemy with a two-edged sword. So is your light dim today, or is it bright? Some people don't even have a light. Not here. Everybody has a light here. Has the heat abated? Is it, is it not as hot as it used to be? You know, when you first got saved, first got filled with the Holy Spirit, you were probably really on fire. Have you ever heard, man, that's an on fire Christian, on fire believer. Are they still saying that about you? Are people still saying you're an on fire believer? Are people still saying that's an on fire church? That's an on fire Christian. Is the fire still bright or is it just sort of embers? Man, that's a real ember Christian. <laughs> is that, oh man, we gotta, we gotta spend some time with him. That fire's almost gone out. We gotta, you know, that's a good one. Just glowing coals. Man, they got glowing coal faith. You should be like those special birthday candles and when you blow them out, it looks like they're out and then they come back. When the world blows you out, you come right on back burning. And then once you're burning, you should be like those sparklers. 
They are shooting sparks everywhere and they cannot be blown out. And once you pass the sparkler phase, you should be like the firecrackers that are exploding all over the place and making a lot of sound and a flash of glory. God has chosen you to be a bearer of the flame. God has chosen us to carry the flame. He has put his flame upon each and every one of us. It's up to us to keep it. I want to read you something. I wasn't going to read this, but I decided to because it sort of fits. This is a story about a revival preacher named Peter Cartwright, who was famous for telling it like it is. He was preaching one time near Washington, D.C., and the people of the church heard that Andrew Jackson was coming to visit. So they took Mr. Cartwright aside. Andrew Jackson was the president. And they said, listen here, Peter, the president is going to be here on Sunday, and we know that sometimes, you know, you kind of get offensive. So could you please tone it down? We don't want to upset the president. So Peter got up in the pulpit the next Sunday, and his first three sentences were these. I understand that the president of the United States, Andrew Jackson, is with us this morning. I have been asked to be guarded in my remarks. Andrew Jackson will go to hell if he doesn't repent. The church was appalled. But when the worship was over, Andrew Jackson came up and grabbed Mr. Cartwright's hand. He shook it. He said, sir, if I had an army of men like you, I could whip the world. You are not going to be offensive when you are in the spirit. The Holy Spirit, not your spirit, not the spirit of the world, not the spirit of fear, not a, not a spirit of compromise. But the Holy Spirit, when you are yielded to the Holy Spirit, you will be burning with the pure fire of God. And that fire will show a light. That fire will show a way. That fire will show the truth. You'll speak the truth. You'll walk in the truth. You'll see signs and wonders and miracles. Look what happened. The first thing that happened is Peter stands up and preaches. Peter, who was afraid to admit he was a friend of Jesus, a few weeks before, stands up and preaches, unafraid, 3,000 people come into the kingdom of God. It's time for 3,000 to come into the kingdom of God in a single meeting. It's time. It's beyond time. And we have a church full of people that are spirit-filled. This is the day of Pentecost. Charles Spurgeon said this, Set yourself on fire, and people will come from miles around to watch you burn. Set yourself on fire, people will come from miles around to watch you burn. We have the greatest call to bring in the lost from Charleston to Wilmington to Columbia. It's not going to be through programs. It's not going to be through nice teaching and preaching. It's going to be through the fire of God. It's going to be through individuals burning for the kingdom of God, burning with the fire of God. And people will come in to experience, to be near, to walk in that light, to draw heat from that, and to be a part of what God is doing. What happened when the fire fell on the day of Pentecost? People came running from all over the city. They came running to see what's going on. They came running to be a part of it. And they heard them speaking. They heard them in their own languages. People will come running from all over. We go out soul winning. Yes, we go out inviting them. We won't have to invite them. They will come. They will come to see this great work of God. They will come to see this great move of God. And all it takes is the people of God keeping the fire burning. Rekindling that, keeping the fire burning. It's up to us to get that spark from the Spirit of God. How do we do that? Praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying through the Holy Ghost. How do you rekindle? You rekindle, you renew, you restore by praying. It's simple. It's not something difficult. It's not going to take years and years of years of fasting and praying. It simply takes falling before the Lord, praying in the Holy Ghost every day. Not 24 7 Every day, for some time, for a portion of time, each day, praying in the Holy Spirit while you're driving, praying in the Holy Spirit while you're doing the dishes, praying in the Holy Spirit. Turn off the TV, turn on the Spirit. Turn off the Internet, turn on the Spirit. It's time that we coalesce as a people of God. Because you know if you have a fire here and a fire here and a fire here, you have some fires. But if you put them all together, you have a bonfire. You have a big fire. So we need to put all of our anointing together, praying in the Holy Ghost, believing one for another, praying one for another, encouraging one another, praying in the Holy Spirit. Name somebody and pray for them in the Holy Spirit. Somebody you know is going through something, somebody you don't know. You just know they're in the church. You pray for them. Pray for the church. 
Pray for the ministry. Pray for the revival. Pray for Charleston, the people from Charleston to Wilmington, Columbia. Pray for outreach. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Spend some time praying in tongues, praying in the Holy Spirit. And you will see your flame begin to grow. It's like, here's an example. Here's the church. Barbecue. I could have done it up here, but some of you would have probably started coughing. When I did it one time long, years before, I had a barbecue up here. Anybody remember that? Remember when I had that barbecue and we had to open all the doors because people were choking? Here's the church. It's a barbecue. You got the charcoal on it. And you've got the wood, and you've got the paper, and you light it, and you sit back and you wait for something to happen. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Someday we're going to have some steak. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then here's the church on fire. You put charcoal in, nothing else. But I got a can of lighter fluid. Psst. Got a match. <laughs> That's the church on the Holy Spirit. You're going to have steak a lot faster with that one Amen. than with this one. Amen. Too many churches are like this. We're waiting. What's going on in your church? I don't know, but I'm waiting. I'm praying. I'm praying that that church gets anointed. I'm praying that pastor gets anointed. I'm praying for change. I'm praying. All right. Good, 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 good. Yeah. Then we got this church. What's happening in your church? Man, it's exploding with fire. It is so hot. There's so much going on there. Guess whose choice it is? It's your choice which barbecue you want to use. It's your choice what church you want to have because you are the church. If every single person in our church catches an idea from this message, catches the flame and begins to pray in the Holy Ghost each and every day, begins to pray and pray, you will see a bonfire. You will see an explosion of God's glory, God's miracles, signs and wonders and people streaming in from north and south and east and west. And that's what revival is all about. The Holy Spirit is not just so we can pray in tongues. The Holy Spirit is so that we can do something in tongues. Not just pray in tongues. Yeah, I mean, you know, understand what I mean? Not just make ourselves feel good by praying in tongues, but to pray in tongues in order to do something. It is not for our entertainment. It is something that we do to make things happen. You don't just like the barbecue so you can sit back and say, oh, look at that fire. Isn't that pretty? Wow, I like that. Look at that flame. You like the barbecue to do something, to cook something. And so we have the Holy Spirit to do something. Jesus said it this way. After you've received the Holy Spirit, you'll have power to be witnesses. When you light that fire, everybody knows. How many of you know, you drive through a neighborhood or walk through a neighborhood, you know somebody's grilling, don't you? You can smell it. Sometimes you see a trail of smoke. And you know somebody's grilling. You can, I can smell it. I can smell Mmm, that's steak. Mmm, that's hamburgers. Mmm, those are fish. I can smell what people are grilling. I walk through and I, and I decide whose house I'm going to go visit. But <laughs> when you are on fire, when our church is on fire, people will know. They will know. They will come and they will experience the fire of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.